Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 through, thir uh, through 14. It says, Wheref Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. I'm going to have a word of prayer in just a second, but I, it's my heart's desire everywhere that I travel. We've got a very hurting generation. We've got uh, very few people have made it through this life without being severely hurt. With the divorce rate the way it is, our children are coming up just devastated. With the abuse and sexual abuse and every other type of abuse going on in the drugs and the alcohol and the things in our society, our, we've got a lot of young people that have been very, very hurt. But the truth is, it's not just the young people. We've all been hurt. We've all been hurt in different ways, shapes, forms, and fashions, and I want to do everything that I can tonight. What I'm going to do tonight is I'm, I'm simply going to relate to you what we learned back in March and April in the hospital. And for some of you, many of you know the, the, the story because you're from here and you loved on us so much, but the, the fact is is that when I just got back from a camp in a basketball camp at Agape in uh, Missouri, in a boys' school there, and I did two weeks of a basketball camp, normally participate with the boys and interact a lot with them. And, and, that, and there toward the end of it, I started getting where I was just a few minutes with them and I just no energy, no strength. And it was puzzling. My shoulder was hurting me real bad. And, and uh, so a doctor there prescribed some uh, prednisone for me to take to relieve that inflammation. And, and so I got home and I was finishing up that, that series of prednisone about seven days. And I just wasn't feeling good. I thought maybe it was the stuff I was taking, but I was almost done with it. So hopefully that would, that would stop. And, but I was only home a couple of days here, and, and thank God we were at home. But I, I went to, we ended up in a hospital. I was in severe, severe pain in my abdomen. And, and so we ended up in a hospital and for seven hours, and they did every kind of test you can imagine on a Wednesday night for, for seven hours throughout the night. And when they got through, they couldn't, couldn't find anything and told, sent us home with a severe case of the flu. When I uh, went home and tried to make it through the next day, gave me some painkillers, different things, sort of survived the next day, but it was just getting more and more and more intense, more intense, and, and it was just not going away. It was so excruciating. I've never experienced anything like it. And then uh, at 4 o'clock the next morning, it, we were trying to wait till Friday morning just to be able to go to the doctor, but at 4 o'clock the next morning, I finally woke my wife and I said, I can't take it anymore. We've got to go. I think I'm going to die. We got to the hospital and there for three more hours as they ran tests, and they, they could see, obviously, my stomach was now distended and very hard. They just, and they, they knew that something was wrong, but they didn't know what, and, and they didn't want to just cut me open to see. And so they eventually, uh, they had me there discussing what they're going to do and when I started vomiting blood. At that point, that's really the last I remember, and from that point, that's when Honestly, my wife had to endure it all because I was asleep. I, I really didn't, didn't remember, didn't, didn't really know what was happening to me. But later, probably two weeks later, I found out that the doctor had told her that when they went in, that they expected that my intestines were probably, the blood supply had been shut off to them and that they were dead and that they would have to take them out or some of them out. But they had told her very directly, you have to understand, we'll... We'll do what we can, but we can't take them all out. And he's also, he's gone septic, and, and it's gone into his bloodstream, and his organs may start shutting down while he's in surgery. The last words they were, were to her was, do you have a pastor? It was at that point that she, she said she just, she broke down, began to weep, and, and God began to work to bring Brother Wilkerson there and uh, different people there, and just, uh, just incredible we, the prayers of God's people began to do. But my wife was asked later, and I don't really remember when, but she was asked to write an article about what we went through. 
And she began to write this, and I'm, I'm going to read just a small portion of it, mostly for those that don't know the story much. But Dr. Blaze is the man that, humanly speaking, saved my life, but we know that only God spared me. When Dr. Blaze, uh, this is what she wrote, when Dr. Blaze came out of surgery and informed us that Robert was critical but alive, I was elated he was alive. The good news, he said, I did not have to remove any bowel. The blood flow to the bowel was fine. The bad news is we could not find the source of the infection. We don't know what caused it. He had spent two hours combing through every inch of intestine and, and abdominal organs trying to find a reason that this could have occurred, but there was none to be found. The next six days were spent in ICU with Robert fighting for his life. The official diagnosis of his illness is primary bacterial peritonitis sepsis. A long title to describe one little aggressive bacteria, group A strep, that somehow found its way into the tissue lining of the abdominal cavity and lay there dormant until it was activated into life by the immune-suppressing steroid prednisone. The bacteria caused a severe, terrible infection to set up in the abdominal cavity, which in turn leached into the bloodstream poison in the body. The curious thing about this type of invasive strep bacteria is the rarity of finding it in the abdominal cavity. It could only have gotten there via a wound or through the blood. It never showed up in the blood until it went septic and there was no wound to the cavity found that could have given entrance to the strange little blood. The mystery still remains. After ICU, I was in for 14 more days in IMCU. During these days, I was still in and out. My memory and comprehension of the time is hazy at best. But during this time, a teaching from Dr. Howes came to me from a, a counseling session I was having with him. I was sitting in his office, and I was there in this. I'm going to try to describe now what takes place during one day there. And I don't know if it was a few minutes. I don't know if it was a few hours but I began in my mind to be sitting in Dr. Howell's office and I was talking to him about an issue that I was having with another individual that I, I just felt where there's some decisions that were not right. And he made this statement to me in that, in that counseling session. It's been something that's been a, a statement that I've kind of used throughout my life. He said, every man lives by his own set of ethics. And as I heard it that, that day, I was puzzled by it. I said, how can you have your own set of ethics? And he said, I'm not talking about morality. I'm not talking about uh, doctrine. He said, I'm talking about maybe business dealings. He said, Bob, you're the type of guy that if you sell a car, you're going to tell him about everything on it. I mean, you're going to tell him everything that it could be wrong, might be wrong. You know, you're going to tell him all those things. He said, but he said, another man may say, look, you know, hey, he needs to ask me. If he don't ask, that's his problem. He said, but both of you feel like you're doing right. You have a different set of ethics. He had taught me that men offer differ greatly in what they perceive to be just and unjust, right and wrong. He's not always intentionally doing wrong, but rather that which seems so wrong to me does not to him. My sense of justice and his are vastly different. And that's when the Holy Spirit said to me that day in that incoherency, but yet very clearly said to me, it's not whether they are wrong, the real issue is are you. And that's where God began to work on me that day to teach me why I was in the hospital. For years, I'd been teaching and counseling those who struggle with hurt, injustice, and bitterness. I first preached a message here at the, in the youth conference back in 1999 on the root of bitterness. And from that time, God had opened up a door for us for hurting people and, and people that were hurt honestly with bitterness. I'd taken the, as a text the text that I just read to you, and that's the text that I preached that day. And that day was about Amnon and Tamar and Absalom and David and, and the whole story. And I'm not going to go into that, but even Jobeth eventually wrote a, a prayer formula uh, that she primarily used for women, but it was to, uh, seven steps to go through to help a lady who is hurting and to be relieved of the bitterness inside of them. We had taught the primary need for the removal of bitterness is forgiveness. We must forgive. And that was the primary need to, for this bitterness to be eradicated from us. But 
I even taught about Corey Ten Boom so many times as I would teach on this and have a PowerPoint on it. And I would teach how Corey Ten Boom in the, in the concentration camp, she and her sister, how they were abused and how they were starved and they were stripped naked and they were sexually abused. And she eventually watched her, her sister murdered in that concentration camp and how at the end of the war, a man, she was giving testimony in a church service, end of the war, a man started toward the front. And as he started toward the front, he, he had a, a hat on, a dress hat and coat, and, and she saw him, and immediately she did not see a, a dress coat and hat. She saw a Nazi uniform, for she recognized him as the man who had murdered her sister. And he stuck out his hand when he got to her and said, I'm a Christian now, will you forgive me? She says that everything inside of her, she says, there's no way, there's no way I can forgive. There's no way that I can touch his hand. There's no way I can do that. She said, but the Holy Spirit just simply said, reach forth your hand. And she said it took everything inside of her. She fought to reach forth her hand, but when their hands touched, that the Holy Spirit of God flooded her soul with grace and forgiveness. Now I'm going to shift and go into what God next. He reminded me this thing of forgiveness, but then he, he brought to my mind what I had been an underlying prayer for about two years now. Many of you, you'll tell me that you, you read my walks, my, my little posts that I do. But for nearly two years, I've had one underlying prayer. Philippians 3.10, that, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Each night I pray that prayer. Each night I beg that I may know him. But you know, along with knowing him, there's the rest of the verse. As a result of praying this prayer, he has been and continues to teach me his word in incredible ways. But now he was taking me to the context of the verse and to the complete verse saying, do you want to know me if it costs you everything? There that day in that incoherency, he was saying, do you want to know me if it costs you everything? And this is very hard to say, but six months ago, I was cut open physically. And tonight, I've come to my home church to cut myself open to let you know what we learned so that maybe somebody here might be helped. That day, God spoke to my heart about two specific people who had, I, I had felt had hurt me and my family. I had prayed for months asking the Lord to remove all bitterness from my heart. Every night I would pray and say, Dear God, I know bitterness does not destroy them. It destroys me and those around me. So God, I want it out of my heart. And I would say over and over, Lord, I forgive. I forgive. But the Holy Spirit said, you may have forgiven, but you still want them to answer for what they did. You want them to suffer the way you suffered. You see, we as good Christians, we can forgive. But in reality, we, what we do is we subdue it. We hold it down, we bury it. And then he said something to me. He said, you must ask them for forgiveness. And I'll be honest with you, even in my weakness and my stupor, I said, God, I didn't do anything to them. God, I don't understand, what are you telling me? And I have shamefully have to admit, if I was physically strong, I probably would not have yielded at that moment. But it was then that God began to teach me that my entire illness was a picture of what he was trying to, to help me with. You see, he began to teach me why I was in the hospital, a parallel of the infection that, and how it parallels to the spiritual condition that we have. 
You see, they said that group A strep could come, only come in through a wound. A group A strep represents bitterness that enters via a wound, but in me there was no wound. They searched my intestines for two hours, pulled them out of my body and pumped them up with gas and, and put them underwater, they told us, and they searched everywhere. And they said, basically, it, what I had was impossible to have because there was no perforation of the bowels. There was no wound for entry. They could not explain it. And then days later, after culturing, saying surely there was a wound, surely there was something, surely there was a perforation, but then when they cultured the bacteria, they found that there was no other bacteria under the, other than strep A, and if it had come from the intestines, there had been something common to the intestines also in there. In other words, God let it be there. The group A strep represents bitterness that enters via a wound. The cavity represents that perfect sterile environment of faith and trust that encases our spirit. One day the spirit is weakened due, due to a traumatic event. This trauma is something unjust, horrific, something that our minds cannot process, something illogical, rare, atypical. That's the way they describe my illness. Something we cannot understand. We find ourselves asking God, why? If you love me, how could you let this happen to me? It makes no sense to our head. But our heart rate drops, inflammation occurs, we become swollen with grief and depression, tears flow unabated into every vulnerable uh, open cavity of our lives. Our breathing becomes labored, the dark modeling effects of death begin to appear. The surgeon sees, the surgeon knows the toxic shock syndrome is possible. It's a matter of life and death. We have to trust him in his care. If we don't place our trust in his skillful hands, there's no hope at all. But to purpose to fight alone is foolhardy and disastrous. Yet many do. God showed me that day the infection is normally because of a wound. He said, a wounded spirit, who can bear? And the bacteria lies dormant until the body is in a weakened state, then it spreads. You see, that's what happens to us when we've been hurt. And even when we say, God, cleanse me, cleanse me, cleanse me, and I think forgiveness is vital in this cleansing process, but can I tell you, God was taking me to a new level because it's not enough. It's not enough. Because in reality, we are subduing it. We subdue it until we're in a weakened spiritual state, and then all of a sudden, it comes out of our mouths. All of a sudden, we lash out. That's when the Lord finally brought me to this verse that I don't know how many times it went over and over in that, that day in my mind. The Lord took me to the cross. And I, I didn't hear him speak, but the words kept ringing in my mind. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. My prayer had been that I may know him. I was seeing this fulfilled as he taught me, and I felt I was getting closer to the Lord almost daily. As we began our ministry in January full time, the second part of the verse where it says, Father, forgive, I mean, it was, says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That power of his resurrection, the second part was being answered as the Lord and his mercy and goodness came in power and blessed as we taught and preached around the nation. Even at the Agape, right before I left, they, they didn't tell me until afterwards, but there's a boy been there, an atheist, and he was, he was into Satan worship, and he was tattooed all over and all messed up. And six months, preachers tried to witness to him. Six months, everybody tried to get to him. And, and I had prayed. I said, dear God, I need to know you and have the power of your resurrection. And the last service I preached, he was on the second row, and I said, won't you trust Jesus? He threw up his hands, and he said, yes. And God was so incredible to us. Then in the end of March, the third part was being fulfilled as I had the opportunity to go through some physical suffering. But thank the Lord he was there so his fellowship, his companionship was present through the suffering and continues to be so. 
That's when he brought me to the last part of the verse. The part that I didn't even like reciting when I'd walk in prayer, being con made conformable to his death. You see, what the Lord taught me that day is being made conformable unto his death does not mean to physically die right now, but rather acquiring the same attitude and attributes that Christ had as he died. What the Lord showed me is that Christ, as he was dying, he was fully submitted to the will of the Father. He said, not my will, but thine be done. He could have called 12 legions of angels to destroy the world and stop it all, but he did not. He submitted his will to the will of the Father. Secondly, he taught me that he opened not his mouth, even though he'd been beaten and even though he'd been lied about and even though he'd been hurt so, so severely, he opened out his mouth. He did not accuse. He didn't blame. He didn't lash out in anger. And then finally, he said, Father, forgive them. You see, he wanted forgiveness, but not, he didn't simply say, I forgive. But rather, Father, forgive. This implies to me not only forgiveness as we understand it, but a desire that with that forgiveness would come pardon from the sin and wrong. It's one thing to forgive someone. It's another thing to desire mercy for the one who has wronged you. I was close to death several months ago. I hope and pray that through the grace and mercy I've been shown that when that time does come, I will be conformed more closely to Christ because of what, he allowed, what he's allowed us to experience. I know some of you here tonight, you're saying, but... I was hurt, Brother Hooker, and they knew what they were doing. I don't want them to get all free. I want you to understand that praying for mercy and praying that God would forgive them does not set them free. Desiring mercy for the offender brings mercy to you. By asking for mercy, you've, you're free God to vindicate you in his way, in his time, and you get mercy for yourself. So asking for mercy does not vindicate, vindicate the perpetrator, it vindicates you because regardless of why you are hurting, if we have a spirit of condemnation in our heart, then we are also guilty of iniquity. Our judgment of others brings the judgment back to us. Scripture says, judge not that you be not judged. For what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Judge means to condemn, to punish, to avenge. We say, I forgive, but inside we want to be avenged. God finally confirmed this days later, but I told you I... God has said you have to ask them to forgive. And I called two people on the phone, and I don't remember how. I, I, until later, my wife told me that I asked her to dial the numbers because I couldn't even hold a phone or see a phone, and she held them up to me. And on voicemail for both, I simply said, please forgive me. Because God has shown me that even though I thought I had done nothing wrong. The fact that I wanted vengeance. I wanted them to hurt. Down deep hidden inside of me, it would erupt every time there was a weak moment. Whenever my spiritual immune system was weakened, something would come out so that I would have to go each night and once again say, God, please, Take the bitterness out. You know why I had to plead with them to take it out again? Because it was there again. Why I had to beg him to, to tell him I forgive? Because I had to forgive again because it had erupted again. John, God confirmed all of this through Job. Job 42.10, and you know the story of Job. Job went suffered so greatly and his friends came to him, and their words hurt him deeply. Their words attacked him. 
Their words, I'm sure, sank deeply inside of him. They hurt him so badly and, and were wronged him so much that eventually God told them, you're in trouble. But God brought me to Job 42.10. And I want you to listen to this. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. The Lord turned the captive. Job was under the captivity of Satan. Job was under the captivity of anger. Job was under the captivity of bitterness. Job was under the captivity of hurt. And God said that God turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. I believe that on my heart, Job prayed, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You understand what it's saying? They were not set free. Job was set free. Job was set free when he prayed, God, have mercy on them. Have mercy on them. He was set free. I'm here to testify since that day I've not had to walk and pray and say, God, take the bitterness out of my heart. God, I forgive. No, each night I simply say, oh, God, give mercy. And I thank him for the mercy. Listen, folks, the day I called is the day you asked my wife that the pneumonia started to recede, that, that I started to recover, that I started to live. God gave me mercy. Two men kindly came to my hospital room later. Both hugged me and told me they loved me. One whispered, there's nothing to forgive. But I said, yes, because I was so wrong. We must not desire vengeance, for the Lord has said in Romans 12, 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing you, he coals of fire upon his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. There's two men that understood this and I need one of my Bible scholars and researchers to tell me, but I've been saying every day that I need to look this up. But, you know, there's a, a man named Stephen full of the Holy Ghost. Somebody's got to tell me and help me to find out if there's some way to know, was Stephen at the cross? Could he have been? Could he have heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them? For as they died... The scripture says they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and, listened, and cried with a loud voice, lay not this sin to their charge. You see what they're killing him. What had he done to them? But he heard the Lord say, Father, forgive them. And Stephen said, lay not this sin to their charge. Father, forgive them. There was a man holding the coats while they killed Stephen. His name was Saul. Later, as Paul, he wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15, in my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. He said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. And I'm here to say, folks, I beg you tonight. There's a lot of hurting people. And the truth is, there's a lot of people that need to be set free. And just as Job 
The captivity will be lifted when you pray for the very ones who hurt you. But it's a specific prayer. Father, have mercy. Father, forgive them. And I'm asking you to do a hard thing. I know it's hard. But I thank God I would not change a thing. The past six months, we've seen the hand of God like no other six months in my life. We've seen God miraculously care for us and provide for us. We've seen him teach us. We've seen him put on the hearts of people to love us and be good to us. But mostly, he allowed me to be free. For my children to be free. And may for every church that I've been to since I've been able to stand in the pulpit and preach. It's only been six or seven times, but every place I've been. There's been people that physically, in a sense, stepped forward and said, it's Corey Timbo. But this time it wasn't, I forgive. They came forward and said, Father, forgive. And their life begins anew. 